Okay, good evening, everyone. Great group tonight. My name is Catherine Carney Feldman. I'm from the Ipswich Conservation Commission, and this is a presentation by the Ipswich Conservation Commission. I would like to introduce tonight Ben Gahegan. He is a fish biologist from the Department of Marine Fisheries in Massachusetts, and he's going to be talking about restoring saltwater fish to our watershed. Ben? Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for everybody for coming out tonight. It's great to see everybody interested in the subject. Um, as you can see, the layout tonight is the monitor is over there, so I will give everybody an opportunity who's sitting like right in here. If you are afraid of having your neck get sore, you want to do this what this wise fellow did and rotate your chairs. Uh, the, uh, that's going to really be the attraction. I'm going to be over here talking, but I'm nowhere near as interesting, hopefully, as what will be on the screen. So, with that, uh, we can get started. So, I did the slightly less technical term here of migratory fish. Today, uh, and I managed to sneak Ipswich into the title. I, I think originally this was North Shore Watersheds, but since we're in Ipswich, we'll say Ipswich Bay. I'm going to be talking about diadromous fish. Um, so in the title I said migratory, but here we go, diadromy, our first big science word of the night for those of you who don't know it. Um, it's an umbrella term for any type of fish that as part of their life cycle has to move between fresh water and salt water to complete their life. So in Massachusetts and really on the east coast of America, we're mainly dealing with two type of fish when we talk about that. And those are our anadromous fish. And those are fish like classical model everybody thinks of what a sea run fish is a salmon. It spends most of its life in salt water growing larger and then comes back into fresh water to spawn, deposits its eggs, and then the, the juveniles grow up for some period of time, but spend most of their life in salt water. And on the east coast, we're mostly, in the past we're talking about Atlantic salmon. There's kind of a thing of the past now because they're fairly environmentally sensitive and they need larger rivers, cool waters. That's some of the habitat that's disappeared the quickest on the East Coast. So really, we're talking about in Massachusetts now, rainbow smelt. In our larger rivers, we have American shad. Uh, we have river herring, two species of river herring, the alewife and the blueback herring. Uh, and then, uh, I said rainbow smelt hopefully already. So we have a couple other species as well, which we'll go to, we'll go, I'll show pictures of. And then the opposite of that is a catadromous fish. Another word, catadromous. The only species we have in North America that's catadromous, so that's a species that's living most of its life in freshwater, and then going to saltwater to spawn is the American eel. And that is in a pretty much ubiquitous fish on the East Coast. And definitely a whole different way of conducting your business and very fascinating creatures. So, an important question is why would you be diadromous? Why make this huge journey and have all these physiological changes that you have to do? So here's a figure, our first big figure, and on the vertical axis on the top here, you have the number of species, and the horizontal axis is the degrees of latitude. So on the, all the way to the left, you have the equator, and as you move farther down that axis, you're getting to higher latitudes, whether they be north or south. And you have two different objects here. These dark filled circles are the number of catadromous species as you move poleward, and the, the open circles are anadromous species. And you see this different relationship where you have a lot of catadromous species closer to the equator. And as you move poleward, you see more anadromous species. Why is that? The main theory is that it has to do with primary productivity. So the same idea here with the axes. And then uh, the, here the dark squares are freshwater. And this is primary productivity now on the vertical axis. So you see by the equator, freshwater has much higher primary productivity. There's a lot more food in freshwater. So it makes sense to be a catadromous animal, spend most of your adult life growing large in freshwater because that's where all the food is. In, in equatorial salt water, it's very low productivity. It's very warm all year long, but there's not a lot of dynamic currents or upwellings that bring nutrients up. So it makes sense to live your adult life in freshwater and then go to salt water to spawn. The opposite is largely true as you get to higher latitudes where the sea is more productive, but maybe the freshwater is a safer place to deposit your eggs. So now we have the basics of what these fish are and why, perhaps, we can talk about our home. And I'm going to talk tonight about three major watersheds in Ipswich Bay, the Parker River, the Ipswich River, and the Essex River. And I'm going to talk about what I think of as the usual suspects for my job. 
And so here we have river herring, uh, the very similar but larger American shad, an American eel. This is a sea lamprey, a white perch, rainbow smelt, and finally the uh, often forgotten Tommy cod. I just had to put a picture of that little guy up there. The smallest of our, our gadids, all our ground fish. So today I'm going to really focus in on, though, since they're the main occupants of our, the three rivers I'm talking about, river herring, American eel, and rainbow smelt. So I will start with the rainbow smelt. Who here eats rainbow smelt? Do people, more people need to eat rainbow smelt. They're delicious, and they smell like cucumbers. They're fantastic fish. Um, also, I'm very informal if you have not gathered that yet. So at any point, if you have a question, please feel free to ask. Don't need to wait till the end. I'm happy to field questions as we go if it helps you understand the talk a little bit better. So let's talk about rainbow smelt first. This is going to be really depressing. I hope you guys were not here for anything uplifting. This is going to be depressing the whole, the whole, the whole way through. <laughs> the, when you deal with diagenous fish, you deal with depression. Um, rainbow smelt. So the colors aren't showing up great on this figure, but basically the orangish pink is historic distribution. And this is like 1950. And now we're talking this is the current. And you could probably even clip off uh, Rhode Island now. The farthest south we can find rainbow smell is the Wee Wee River. So it's more like that. Um, so not only are we seeing a range contraction, but we're seeing catches drop off all over the place in Massachusetts, Maine, and uh, New Hampshire. The catches have been greatly reduced. Maine has finally even started to do a little bit of conservation measures, which Maine does not do typically. So that says something. Um, this is likely largely tied to climate change. I mean, they're, another nickname for them is frost fish. They're a cold water fish. They, they're just starting their spawning migrations right now, and it's like three degrees Celsius in the water, you know, under 10 degrees, around 10, or sorry, around like 35, 38 in the rivers right now, Fahrenheit. So they're a cold water fish. So when you do have really warm winters, you have low, like we just had for the most part, we have one good cold snap, a pretty warm winter. It usually doesn't bode well for that type of fish. The Gulf of Maine is one of the most rapid, rapidly warming bodies of water on the globe. So the large scale shifts in our global climate that we're seeing is really not good for this fish. Locally, this is a measure of abundance. Uh, I'm not going to get into technically what CPU is. It's just a matter of how many fish we're catching for how much effort we're putting in. And you can see we started this fike net here in the Parker River in 2005, and we had some moderate catches. And since then, it's really just dropped off the shelf. And uh, I think, you know, if I, I think last year I got 17 fish all season running the net for 10 weeks, and that was like a big year. I was excited. I actually saw some smelt. So it is, yeah. This is a, yes, this is a, a long-term monitoring station. So we have several of these, I'll, and we'll get into a little bit of that. So yeah, so this is one of our long-term monitoring stations. Um, and unfortunately, it's been fairly poor. And the Parker is really one of the few rivers north of Boston where we've, in the past 30 years, had a very stable smelt resource. A lot of the other rivers, we've lost it due to industrial impacts earlier in our history. And I'll talk a little bit more that, about that now. Um, because there are so few populations on the North Shore, we actually undertook an experimental stocking program where we got uh, spawning adults from the Four River, which despite its urban setting has a really strong run, one of the strongest runs, if not the strongest run in Massachusetts, bring those back to the lab and we would spawn them in the lab and then stock the larvae out into rivers, uh, the North Saugus, Crane, and Essex rivers. We did Four Rivers, so we would hatch these little fish out. You can see them here in the beakers. And we fish have little bones in the ears called otoliths, and they use them as part of balance, their balance system. But the really nice part is that you can, they grow incrementally with the fish so that you can age fish. And also if you bathe them in oxytetracycline, which you, everybody here has had oxytetracycline as an antibiotic at some point. So if you cut open your teeth, you'd see little rings like this if you look under a fluorescent microscope, because it does leave a little fluorescent ring. So we could mark these uh, larvae when they were in the lab just add a little bit of oxytetracycline to the water they were in as we were growing them. And then if we collected them as adults and looked under a microscope, that's what we would see. So if we catch a smelt, we take out their otolith. We can tell whether we stocked it or if it was a natural, it was naturally there. It was a naturally reproducing population already. 
So it's a neat way that we do this with a lot of fish to understand what's going on. So we put a lot of effort into this over a number of years. We, uh, we stocked out almost 10 million larvae into these four rivers over four, uh, over four years. And we caught under 50 fish that had marks on them. And these fish start coming back as early as year one. So, and then beyond that, when we stopped stocking, our catches just completely dropped out. We stopped catching smelt. So the idea was basically we caught very few fish. There were very, if there were any, na any natural populations in these rivers anyways, they were just barely there. They were maybe even strays from other places. So, and then unfortunately our big effort to try and bring these populations back indicated that it was the habitat it wasn't just that they blinked out and they just needed to be restored. It was the habitat that was still not good for them. So efforts on our part to restore those populations would probably just be a waste of time and money. Yeah. To, I, I, no, I think they probably went out into the estuaries and were eaten or died because of environmental conditions or died shortly you know, before they became full juveniles or adult fish. It's a guy I wish I knew. I don't have a good explanation for you there. Um, I, I, these are largely estuarine fish. Um, across all our diagenous, uh, all our diagenous species, for whatever reason, despite the large scale of urbanization, um, Boston Harbor runs are great. And I don't know if it's something about Boston Harbor or that part of Massachusetts Bay that is highly productive. And once those fish make their way out there that they do well, um, but the Mystic River, the Charles River are two of our biggest river herring runs. Uh, we have those smelt runs, smelt runs in some of those southern uh, Boston Harbor rivers. So I'm not sure why, but I think that there's an estuarine connection there. Yeah, no, these fish aren't spending the winter in the, um, that's a great question, that I just didn't explain well. These, the, these fish are dropping out into the actual estuaries uh, during the winter. So it could be um, an estuarine condition, but it could also just be, I think in some of these rivers like the North Saugus and Crane and the Essex, is it's actually probably spawning habitat too has been impacted. So when fish come back and they have failed spawning, um, that which can happen, these fish spawn right at the headwater the head, the head of tide and the first riffle past the high tide and those are places that can really get impacted and if they don't have, they lose that right combination of the, exactly the right place in the tidal cycle with the right substrate, then they go away. In the case of the Essex River, the locals, uh, people who have lived on the river tell me a long, for a long time have told me that the landfill that's a super fun site right up there, and you can see the fence if you ever drive on 22, um, has groundwater contaminants that come up and if you, and like, you, like not as much now, but in the past you could like scoop up the gravel in the river and you could see like bubbles of stuff, like oils coming up. And so that's probably what happened in the Essex River. These are, I mean, uh, uh, like world record smelt is like 14 or 15 inches. So they're really, for the most part, they're not in the same place as the cod. They're, they're typically further, especially where cod effort is now, they're further inshore than, cod, than commercial cod effort. And they're so small that unless you had a lot, a lot, a lot of fish in the net, they'd probably swim right out. The mesh size on the net wouldn't entrap these fish. at both those sites for fish, and I have never, unfortunately, seen them there. But I... Yeah. No, no problem.
that could be a factor as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that with any, with all these fish, it's uh, it's more of a death by a million cuts situation than like, a silver bullet. And you, a lot of people look for silver bullets with all these fishes, and I don't think that they're there. I think that it's just like indignity upon indignity that's been these fish have been forced to deal with. Um, and well on a plate canvas moving between the two makes sense when you start putting in all of the impacts from human activity it makes it a very difficult life history to successfully do generation after generation unfortunately which species Um, sharks on the whole are down. There's a lot of sharks still out there. I run into them pretty frequently. Bluefish here is so is so dicey. It's not. I think what the the inner annual pattern of bluefish in Ipswich Bay and north of Cape Cod is really driven by climactic factors. Um, more than anything, if you have the right population size, we're really the northern northern edge of the bluefish. So in years where the water's warm enough, we might get a run of bluefish up the North Shore. And other years that just never show, um, so I don't. I don't think so. It's a good question, though, Jeff. No populations in the ocean. Zeros. Yeah, there, well, um, some, of, some of the South Shore runs can have good years, too. But, I mean, really, we're talking, we're at the now at the southern extent of the range. All right, any more smell questions before I move on? Yep. Yeah, it may, um, both water withdrawals and the climate shifts we're going to see in precipitation patterns because these fish have a six to eight week window to pull this off. And it's typically not a period of time where we'd be really hurting from withdrawals because it's, you know, March and April. It's typically a high water time of year, but it could certainly be a factor. And if we do see, the, uh, we're, we're forecasted to have more rain in a shorter period of time in a different period of time during the year in the Northeast. So we'll see what happens. I will now shift to American eel. Um, as I said, I think these are absolutely fascinating creatures. Uh, incredibly resilient. They can, you can find them everywhere. You can go 70 miles inland over like eight dams, like a 50 foot dam and you'll find an American eel because they're just amazing. These, this is the uh, glass eel phase. So as I said before, these are the reverse of what we think of sea run fish. The adults are going out, they're spawning in the Sargasso Sea off of Bermuda. And then their larvae go through several transformations as they float around. They get into the Gulf Stream and they just, they don't home back to the rivers their parents were in. They just kind of randomly find fresh water and come in through these estuaries and up rivers. And they transform from a willow leaf, uh, willow uh, sorry, willow leaf shaped larvae called the leptocephalus into the glass eel. And so here you can see uh, these are glass eels climbing a vertical surface. If it, they can climb up to eight or nine feet if it's a wetted surface and they'll just writhe right up. So you can see just a couple thousand fish here. If you look back in the corner, you can see a whole pile of them. They, this is just a wetted surface and everywhere else here, the flow is too high and they're just trying to climb up and get upstream. This is looking straight down a, a surface. So these are little glass eels. And we have um, a counting station much like the one for smelt, for eel now in Essex. And so this is us, we're counting them as they swim out of the bucket. And some days we might get 50 and some days we might get 7,000. So you can be there for a while. Yep. I didn't hear that. Um, 
So American Eel, uh, yet again we have kind of a story that's not super optimistic. You can see the com this is commercial landings along the U.S. coast from 1950 on, and we had a peak in the 70s, and it's been a downward slide since then. Um, in almost all states, you can harvest yellow eels, which are these sub-adult eels that are in fresh water that you know are anywhere from six to 18 inches long. It's popular striper bait. Um, Coastwide abundance is considered depleted, but relatively stable at a low level. This is dams, mostly dams that are affecting American eel and probably water quality, but they're really resilient fish. They've had multiple petitions from some guys in Maine to NOAA to list them, until you start U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but both times they've reached negative determination, so they were not listed or considered threatened. Out of all the fish I'm talking about today, rainbow smelt should probably be listed. If any of these are going to be listed, it should be rainbow smelt. Or, but on the other hand, there's nothing we can do about it, probably, which is sad. But they listed polar bears, and we're not going to do anything about that. So I don't know. What? Uh, eels? Yeah. They eat uh, everything. Having an adult American eel in a tank is a great pet. I've done that. Those are fun. You can feed them any type of fish or crayfish or anything, and they're just going to it, it, turn off the lights, just have a little bit of low light, and they just get very active and absolutely pretty fun to watch. Yeah. You have adult American eels. Okay, good. <laughs> They're very cool. Very cool. Um, so most of our eel monitoring is done with this here. This is called a Sheldon trap. Flow goes from upstream here on the right side of the picture downstream. So fish and cat. Like I, as you saw in that picture, they like low flow gradients. They like lower flow because they're tiny. They can't swim very strongly, so they try and seek out edges where there's less flow. So they come up walls like this, and then we count that they go into this box. We count them. We had one of those in the Parker River for a long time. Um, it was so variable, as you can see here. These are the error bars, and all you can see in the first couple of years it wasn't bad, but as we had fluctuations in flow during the course of a spring. It was so flow dependent where we had the trap, it just was not giving us a stable signal. So we ended up discontinuing that and moving to Essex and using a different type of gear. Um, but what you see is basically a low catch, and it's but fairly stable, as I said in the, pat in the prior slide. So talking a little bit more about harvest, uh, if people are aware of the eel, especially the glass eel phase, are typically aware because they've been in the news a lot in the last couple of years. Basically, every state on the East Coast except for South Carolina and Maine had banned the harvest of glass eels. The glass eel market is largely driven by Asia, um, and they get like, the, it's a live fish market, so they get glass eels, they ship them to China, they grow them to size in facility, aquaculture facilities or in ponds, and then those get shipped to Japan and they enter the sushi market. So when you have like a, the, the roasted eel with the sauce and just for your sushi, which is delicious, it may well be an American Eagle that at this size was flown to, Chip to China, grown for a year and a half in China, two years in China, then shipped to Japan, then flash frozen, sent back here. Um, the Japanese pretty much destroyed their eel resource, then they destroyed the eel, the European eel resource, and now they're working on ours. So um, globally, eels are fairly imperiled. Um, in Massachusetts, along with other many states, banned harvesting glass eels, it turned into a very, as the European eel stocks crashed because they were over harvested, it turned into a really lucrative industry in Maine. You could get, you know, a pound is roughly a thousand glass eels and they were getting anywhere from two to five thousand dollars a pound. So you could go out and harvest 10, 15, 20 pounds in a night on a good night and there were guys running around in Maine with security guards. You know, like they had armed guys with them because they were carrying around 30, buyers would be carrying around 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars cash to buy eels on, a, on like the, the height of the run, um, which led to a lot of poaching. When you have that kind of demand, we're 20 minutes from Maine. I, 50 feet from my glass eel monitoring station, I would find nets that people were poaching eels. So it was just, it was really rampant. There's been a lot of reforms to the fishery. It's gotten a lot better. Uh, for a couple of years, there were some guys coming once a year and, uh, poaching eels right out from under the little walkway over the Ipswich River, just below uh, the Sylvania Dam. They, were, they found nets and they get scared off, but it was happening everywhere. 
but it has gotten a lot better. They've been really reformed the fishery. Probably shouldn't still be happening, but they have reformed the fishery. Again, glass eel legal, yellow eel harvest legal in tidal waters. You can catch them and keep them in tidal waters. Not no longer recent change. You can't do that in, in fresh waters anymore. Uh, so there's no catching and keeping unless for consumption in fresh water. Um, recreationally, you can have 20 fish. All have to be greater than nine inches. We're gonna move to river herring now. I'm sorry, this map looks really not great with this projector. Um, this is probably our most abundant diadromous fish resource in the Commonwealth. Here you, in this map, you can see the green does not show up great, but all the rivers that we have river herring in, all the red dots are dams or fishways on river herring, on uh, streams or rivers with river herring. So you can see there's a lot of structures, over 140 fishways in the Commonwealth that are managed by towns, uh, NGOs, or, or us, uh, 78 individual runs. So of these 78 runs, we then have over 30 runs where we collect abundance data. And that's either by us or a volunteer group. Yes, ma'am? Oh, sorry, no, my fault. Um, 14 of those, I'll say we have census level, which means that we're, we're counting in some way that's probably better than 90% accurate. Um, and then eight of those runs, we have biological data. So we're collecting fish every week, sacrificing them so that we can age them, get a sex ratio, a species ratio, and everything else that helps us better manage the fishery. And our internal program goal is to establish a joint high accuracy count with biological data in each major basin of coastal Massachusetts. So we, have, we broke that into the North Shore, Boston Harbor, South Shore, Cape Cod Bay, Nantucket Sound, and Buzzards Bay. So the good news is for us is that because I'm a somewhat ambitious person, all three of the rivers that I'm talking about today have a high accuracy counting method. And that's not just me, that's also uh, for the Ipswich, Ipswich River Watershed Association. It runs a great volunteer account, which is fantastic because it gets you data. They've been doing it for a long time. And it also keeps people involved with their river. So I love volunteer counts. They've all, they're doing the video as well which uh, is a great comparison with the volunteer count. And yeah, Catherine. I think you, well, you'd want to con uh, contact Ryan O'Donnell at Ipswich River Watershed Association. Uh, he runs that program. He may be all set for this spring, but I would certainly get in touch with him and there will be a volunteer request for uh, something else later. So. If you, is it, So um, there's also volunteer counts as well as what uh, on the Parker, although that's tailed off some. So we have really faithful canine watchers and we have people watchers. It's great, we have the full deal. Um, man, this projector is killing me. The, so these are three local runs and you can see the Essex did not have a count till I started working here and that's gone from low to relatively high. It's gone from uh, under 15,000 in, uh, in 2014 and 2015 to over 30,000 in 2016 and 2017. The Ipswich has been stable and quite low, typically under 1,000 fish. And the Parker has been quite low for a long time. And then there's this bump in which we switched from the, the visual count, which seemed to be underestimating the number of fish. And then also, um, I will get into some of the other things that are happening in this rise from roughly 7,000 fish to 70,000 fish in 2016. I use a camera on the Parker. Um, I, the lamprey mess with the, yeah, without getting too technical. Looking statewide, uh, what you see is relatively uh, stable abundances, a lot of, not a lot of long terms data series going back to the 70s or 80s. Uh, the, the monument here, 
and Damascus are some of our longer series, the Mattapoiset. But you can see everybody really crashed in the early 2000s. This wasn't just Massachusetts. This was range-wide all up and down the East Coast. And this led to a lot of concern. We're now, next month, I'm going to be working with Noah on a second endangered species listing determination. So that's the second one in five years where somebody's petitioned or sued for um, getting these fish put on the Endangered Species Act. Me? No, I am a, a expert in river herring, and I am on the work working panel about whether or not they should list it. Yes, I'm not working to get it listed. Yep. Not with the camera. I got some great. I mean, they do. They, they get this great night footage when all of a sudden it's all dark, and all of a sudden the lamprey like poof and it sucks onto the glass. It's awesome. Yeah. So it, the. Who here knows about lamprey? A few people. Okay, I'll just briefly talk about lamprey. Lamprey are also, lamprey and eel are different than our other fish here on the East Coast, our other diatomous fish, in that they spawn once and then die, which is like what everybody thinks of because they see the nature videos of Pacific salmon. We're all do that. Um, river herring, shad, all these other rainbow smelt, they all can spawn multiple times. Some do die after spawning, but they can all spawn multiple times. So when we see lamprey here in our rivers, they're not parasitizing fish. As juveniles, when they're out at sea, they are. They, that's how they make their living. They, they attach. They have a sucker disc mouth. They're very prehistoric fish, some of the oldest evolved fishes. They're a jawless fish. So that, like, when you go back all the way through the diagram of fish evolution, you start with jawed fishes and jawless fishes. That's the first branch. So these are jawless fishes, and they just have a sucker disc with these raspers. They suck onto the sides of larger fish, rasp a hole in the side of that fish, and feed on soft tissues and fluids. When they come into our rivers, they're no longer doing that. They're, doing a, they're having a fairly large transformation, just like a Pacific salmon. They're not feeding. They're putting all their energy into gametes to reproduce. They go blind eventually, which is kind of funny because they end up sidling up to big American eels that have been snorkeling, and you see them like, hey, you look real good, or you feel real good, but I can't tell what you are, and the eels are like, no, no, wrong, sorry. <laughs> so that's pretty funny stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so they're, they're just coming here to spawn and die. So they're actually really important. They serve an important purpose in our rivers. A lot of people kind of demonize these fish because they think that they're hurting the fisheries resources, you know, stripers and bluefish. Oh, they're killing our fish. They're not. They're really important. They come back, and these fish die, and they act just like salmon in West Coast rivers. So they're, they're coming in in mass. They're dying, and they're providing nutrients into our streams, which are largely – rivers can be nutrient poor, so they are important. Yeah. No, they're nightmare sauce. They're, they're, they're nightmares, yep. They're definitely horror movie stuff. So you see this, this was range wide, not just Massachusetts, everybody crashed in the early 2000s. We're still arguing about what happened there. Um, but most of our rivers saw a climb back over the last decade, and this is also where harvest in Massachusetts largely stopped. There, there was a statewide ban on harvest. It started climbing back up. Um, in the past few years, it started to go back down. So as I said, we collect biological samples, 100 fish per week from eight rivers uh, uh, in coastal Massachusetts. So you'll see me, I get the cops called on me a lot because you're not supposed to harvest river herring anymore, and I'm sitting here in waders throwing a cast net or like a dip net trying to catch fish, and a cop comes flying by like, you can't do that. Like, yeah, it's my job. Um, so anyways, this allows us to characterize a run and monitor, monitor for trends in age. So it's part of the story with river herring isn't just that the populations are going down. You can also see really important metrics like the max, the oldest fish we're finding in run has declined over time. So the mean age. So we've seen reductions in the age structure. So this, that's never good. You want to have a lot of different age of fish because these fish are all coming back to reproduce. So you're going to do better if you have fish across multiple years. You have a bad year, the next year they'll come back. When you only have three or four years or two or three years of year classes worth of fish coming back every year, they miss a year. That can really be catastrophic for your run because they might not come back the next year. So you, it, historically, there's probably a fair amount of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds in runs and we just don't see fish older than 10 anymore. And as you can see here from mean age, this is in our most longest monitored run. It's declined from, you know, four and a half to five, over five years to typically just under four. Fred and then. Yeah. 
they're not salmon good at it, but they do. So it's probably closer to 70 to 80%, where like a Pacific or Atlantic salmon, they're, you're talking about over 90% and not just to like that river, to like a patch of gravel, like a third the size of this room. They're like, yep, this is where I come back to spawn. So it's a whole different ball game, but they do home to their native rivers. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure it's, I mean, you don't see the historic, because Manhattan, you see the historical accounts of Manhattan schools like miles and miles long. You don't hear about that in the ocean, open ocean, but for river herring and shad, when you get in historical accounts, it's, it's in rivers, but there's um, off of Mount Vernon, George Washington's estate on the Potomac, there's records of like shad schools that were two miles long and like one big haul saying that, they caught like 30, like three and a half million fish in one haul of the net and stuff like that. Like, I mean, they were feeding the entire plantation and for like three weeks, four weeks until they all rotted and then they just use them for fertilizer. So it was all just a level of biomass that I don't think we can probably really even comprehend that was coming into these rivers, you know, in the 1600s, 1700s. Probably a, uh, probably a mixture of both. Uh, uh, trying to tie it to any one thing has not been successful so far, but we're still working on it. But habitat, both those things are issues. So I'm going to talk a little about little bit about local river herring restoration. Uh, for those of you who don't go looking under bridges all the time, this is uh, underneath the Central Street Bridge in over the Parker River in Byfield. And you can see there's two weirs here. There's one back here and one here. And in the Mother's Day flood in 2006, there was an undercut of this, and so you could, there's a big drop off here. The Mother's Day flood undercut that weir, so all the flow was going, or most of the flow was going underneath, and that appeared to be leading to a big dip in the population size, size because the fishway to get around the dam was right there, and these fish couldn't make it to the fishway entrance. That's what was thought at the time. So we tried restoring this, and what happens when you don't have good engineering is that you do things wrong, and it ended up looking like this. This looks like good surfing for miniature people, but it's really bad for fish passage. It's called the hydraulic jump. Uh, we did correct that, which was great. And then we continued doing modifications and ended up with something like this. And now we had good elevations for the, where the fish could get up because they're not salmon. They can't jump up two feet in the air. Um, there wasn't a lot of competing flow, so fish were going into the fishway rather than in this picture where fish would come up here and then just go and go to the flow associated with the dam. They were coming up the fishway. And that was great. That's our Ed Clark, our main fishway fixer. He was very excited. We did a study uh, where we put tiny little tags into the fish. And we saw from year to year, the kind of the three years of improvements we were making that, so this is pat, the amount number of fish detected at the entrance of the fishway. The orange is at the turn. The blue is at the, is basically after this high gradient area. And the blue is the number of fish that actually made it up the fishway. So we're seeing a huge drop off. From, um, it did get better from year to year where we actually had by the end thir a third, over a third of the fish that entered the fishway making it up. But that was for alewife, for blueback herring, less so. But it's clearly still a fishway that's not working very well. However, that's what drove it up to 70,000 fish from 10, 20,000 fish is that we were getting more fish that were just historically at the base of the dam and not making it up the fishway. And they were making it over the fishway and going up. Um, another thing, we've done a lot of, uh, a lot of restoration activities on the Parker so far. So we had the passage improvements I just talked to you about. This is right after we poured the new concrete weirs. We fixed a, uh, what's called an Alaskan steep pass fishway on Main Street. We fixed the next fishway up from that. Uh, we've 
started managing beavers fairly heavily in this watershed. This is aerial imagery. So this is upstream, this is downstream, and you can see that these are all, this is an old logging road, and these beavers have a fairly substantial and high dam that's pretty much killed all the flow below, so you have wetlands below, you have impounded, flooded roads above, and dam beavers are great, they do a lot of positive things, but a river herring can't make it over that. I mean, I manage them. <laughs> I, I, um, I have gone through all the steps to be a licensed trapper and submitted a plan with Fish and Wildlife so that in migratory fish season, I trap with the approved traps for two weeks and then I can move to restricted use traps. Um, the, I'm not looking to eradicate beavers. I'm looking to balance beavers and fish passage and have both because they are really important parts of the uh, ecosystem. So we also started moving fish because we had a lot of beavers in all through here um, and failing fishways. We started moving fish from that first dam into Pentucket Pond where they hadn't been for 15 years, but it was their spawning habitat. So a little bit of everything. The Ipswich, we've been active in the last few years. I've moved on to work on the Ipswich some. Um, the water withdrawal issue has been so pervasive here that it's, it hasn't been a high priority, but we're getting here. And if we can solve some of the issues, it's great because it's a long, large river. It's the largest river we have north of Cape Ann. Uh, so the work there has included working with the town here at Sylvania to make sure that that fishway was maintained and operated correctly within season, which the town's been great about. Very cooperative, very helpful. They've been on top of it. Not all towns or organizations or dam owners are. The town of Ibs, which I'm happy to say has been. Uh, we've also tried to provide some technical advice to the Northeast chapter of Trout Unlimited, who have some great volunteers and have worked on rehabbing a old fishway at the Willowdale Dam by the Foot Brothers Canoe. Uh, simultaneous to that, we're working with the Foot Brothers in the town and other partners, including Ipswich River Watershed Association, to put a newer, more effective fishway on the dam, and that should be happening this summer. So we're really excited about that. Yep. know what they prefer, dealing with the constraints of the site and a fish, the fish way that was probably first built in the 20s or 30s and then last rehabbed in the 1970s when people didn't necessarily know um, is difficult. Uh, you know, so we're continually working on that. I have design plans and I need to go find money to implement a better solution than what's there now um, because it's just not a site. The, the type, there's different types of fishways you can put in, tech, technical fishways, that's a pool and weir. That's the design of it. So it's pools with the little weirs. Um, just like you can see in this picture of Willowdale, there's, you know, there's drops, little weirs that drops into a pool, little weir that drops into a pool. The current thinking on that is that you won't, don't want higher than a 10% slope then uh, on that. So it's good, it's great for Cape Cod, you know, low gradient, long slope, you can get fish up it. But the, that Parker River site, the initial seven pools are at like 22%, 18%. So it's, it's too steep a spot for a pool and weir, but people didn't realize it wasn't gonna be effective at the time they built it. So we have to do something more major than we've done. Does that help? How do you encourage the slope to that way of thinking at all? Slope is really the determining factor. You can do other things with pool volume that's gonna help and width and everything, but um, slope is for sure the controlling factor. Um, so great to have, here's Alicia, our conservation agent. The Foot Brothers are here, it's River Watershed. So it's great to have a diverse partnership. Yep. Uh, money, 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 people caring. Uh, we're DMF, all of Department of Fishing Games, so Division of Marine Fisheries, Division of Fish and Wildlife, and Division of Ecological Restoration make up a fraction of a percent of the state budget. 
we get across the board cuts like everybody. So when you tell us to cut 10% of our budget, it's a lot more meaningful. It, it, we don't, we're not expensive, but we, we pinch every penny, we make every penny count. So when we get across the board cuts to state budgets, when we have hiring issues, it, it's not great for us. I, I probably said more than I should. Um, <laughs> so, and then we have plans to hopefully stockfish into Hood Pond. I, if I have time, I'm gonna come back to that. I'm starting to speed up here because you guys have asked so many great questions, we're going a little bit long, but that's okay. The Essex is the rare, the Alewife Brook, Essex River to Alewife Brook into Tobacco Lake is one of the rare instances where there is no dam. It's like this weird, peculiar thing. There is no dam here, which is strange for New England. Um, so that's great. The main pro, I mean, this should be a 200,000, 300,000 fish run. And it was down at 15,000 fish when I showed up to DMF. And it's beavers. It's just beavers. Like they were blocking that outflow of the lake up so badly with multiple dams and raising the, the height of everything that fish could not get in and out. To have river herring, all you have to do is get the adults in and out and get the juveniles out. If you can do that, you're gonna have a successful river herring run. They're super beacon. They will just pump out hundreds of thousands of eggs, hundreds of thousands of juveniles. You just gotta get them in and out. So beavers were the issue here. So when I, you saw a huge jump from 7,000 to 45,000, that was the beginning of the fact that myself and then a local trapper pulled a lot of beavers out. And, pull, and, and I can break dams legally. I'm one of the few people who can. So I was breaking dams. Um, and again, it's like, I'm not gonna break dams all summer. They can have their dams in the summer. Um, river herring don't do well with them. No, they don't do well. It's just, they're, um, they don't like what, te the technical term for that would be an orifice passage and they're not wild about or underwater orifice passages. So when they encounter, they, they'll pass over or through a lot of things. When they find a subsurface hole with a lot of flow coming through it, especially like just strong, long distance uniform flow like you'd have through a beaver deceiver, they don't do well with that, unfortunately. I wish they did. Not that I know of. Something for somebody. Yep. something I haven't there's been a lot of different options um, the beaver thing is it's interesting and I understand I understand I think that what I always come back to is that and I'm a biologist so I'm far more comfortable with death than a lot of people and I've come to accept that um, is that humans are we're the controlling factor on this landscape and when we don't make a decision it's the same as making a decision so if we don't manage something, it's gonna do what it does best. And it's going to affect all the things we are trying to manage. So inaction is still a decision. There has to be some acceptance of what our role is on this landscape and what it's turned into. And it, it's hard, but sometimes you have to make choices. And I'm not talking, I don't wanna eradicate anything for the betterment of my fish. I just wanna have both. So that would be the, way, the mental approach I've developed to this issue. So progress, as I said, the nice thing is in, on the North Shore, for the most part, there's been a lot of progress. It's great. Um, since we're in Ipswich, I'm going to talk about not so much progress on the Ipswich River so far, but hopefully what's to come. I did say we're going to stock Hood Pond. Hopefully that's like a 50, like size-wise, like a 50,000 fish run. That'd be great. The, and I say, oh, yeah, we're going to stock Hood Pond. That means that in the next couple of years, we have a dam that we have to rebuild a fishway on or remove that dam. What? <laughs> there you go. Um, we have a culvert that is totally stuffed up and undersized that will need to be replaced. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of beavers. So they'll need to be stream clearing, and nobody's done, nobody's thought about keeping the stream clear with the. Without river herring, historically people did work to keep rivers clear and keep passages clear into rivers and, and take care of their rivers because they wanted river herring. They wanted to be, have them for bait. They wanted to have them for food. They wanted to have them for their gardens. And when people stopped using river herring, they stopped caring about a lot of these rivers. They stopped doing these things. And so now the river herring are feeling the effects of that. Getting back to what I said about we're 
we're the controlling factor on this landscape. There's a lot of river herring populations in Massachusetts that never existed. But then people are like, I want river herring in this lake, so I'm going to dig a ditch from that river to this lake so we can have river herring there. It's all over the place. So, again, there's a lot of things that are going to need to happen to get fish into Hood Pond. And this is a place where volunteers who want to spend a day or two during the summer to help clear out some brush and widen the channel a little bit, still make it fine for trout habitat, um, but make it a little easier for the river herring to get up it eventually. Please get in touch with Brian Kelder, Brian Kelder, Ipswich River Watershed Association. Those are literal, I don't have enough pictures for all the dams I saw. <laughs> so, I mean, like quite literally, you can go on Google Earth and look or Google Maps, like it's all backwater braided, flooded out dead trees from beavers and beaver hutches and everything. Um, that's just what it is. Okay, doom and gloom, more. Uh, so the future, we, I've kind of talked about everything we're doing here to try and help our fish what's going on both range-wide and locally. This is the hard numbers of what we're looking at. Essex County from 1790 to 2010. That's what we've seen. Yeah, this is where in 2010 we were at, 1,500 people per square mile, 574 houses per square mile in Essex County. And well, you know, not to, you know, not to be rude, but uh, many of the people in this room are of the generation where it's like, rivers aren't burning anymore. Clean Water Act, you know, EPA, this is awesome. We're, we're solving stuff. We did this. We made it happen. We have new problems now, and, and it's the problems of our own success. So there's, while the water quality, the, uh, the uh, like long-term measures of water quality are much better than they used to be in most places, we have less water. And we have a lot of secondary, we don't have the primary source, big toxic spills anymore, or like industrial polluters. We have everybody wanting a green lawn. And that's leading to more runoff, uh, more house roof, houses on roofs with houses, sorry, houses with roofs, all the issues that come with that. And we have a lot more algae. We have a lower overall water quality because we have so many fertilizers going into the water. So it's a different set of problems, but we have problems still. So this is the Parker River watershed. And if anybody's seen my talk before, they've seen this slide. Every little orange plot outlined here is a plot that between 1970 and 2000 went from undeveloped land to developed land. So you can see where it didn't, and that's like Martin Burns and the other at WMA. It's the state lands. It's the Great Marsh where you can't build. That's what hasn't changed. Everything else is filling in. So what's filling it in? So this is the, all of that change from 1971 to, to 2000. And 61% of that is changed from a forested lot to a home. So reinforcing what I was trying to say before. We're kind of hurting what we love. So the thinking, about fish biologists, what can we do? As I tried to say before, I think we need to start thinking about the new problems that we have with water quantity and, and, sec and primary, or sorry, secondary source pollution, pollution, all like our household stuff, all the golf courses, stuff like that. So we need to think about how much water we're using and what we're doing with our daily lives that affects water quality. Volunteer, do stream maintenance, do something to help that habitat for all these fish. The needs, as with the fishways, you know, needs outweigh resources here. There's not a lot of people who are, there's people like Jeff who's, who are going up and down the East Coast looking for money and working with Sea Run, Run Brook Trout, but there's not a lot of people doing this. Be an ambassador in your community and participate in your local river restoration efforts. There's great stuff going on in the Ipswich right now. Uh, we're part of the way in a feasibility study to remove a dam that is great historically. It's part of the community, but we have the hard questions now of asking are these things still useful or holding on to them? Because we have very valid emotional connections to them and historical connections to them, but what are their true purpose and are there benefits to maybe letting them go? So, I've taken, almost taken up my hour, a minute and a half left, but I don't really, I have, if anybody has more questions, I can ask them. But if you're
here we are. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me or my boss because I said something that horribly offended you, there it is. Um, we have a lot of resources online. Uh, we our web our website is now very difficult to find anything on because it's been completely redesigned recently. So we're still ironing through that, but uh, there are a lot of resources there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Jad are um, a larger river species. So up here, like we're really talking about the Merrimack River. Historically, they were, when there were more around, we probably saw some in the Barker and the Ituli. That would, would be my guess. Like, oh yeah. Oh, you caught some in Fort Myers Sound. Yeah. So I mean, those could be Merrimack fish that went down the Fort Myers River, uh, or something else. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of shad work also, but that's on the Merrimack. Um, that population is doing is typically like 50 to 70 thousand fish a year. Again, that's dams. That's hydroelectric. That's we're getting very low amount of electricity, in my opinion, like a couple hundred megawatts a year off of dams that are really affecting our natural resources. And that, that's the, what we want to do, that's fine. But again, all natural, I think an important message I try and tell people is to realize that I'm a scientist. I inform natural resource policy. I inform fisheries policy. I don't set it. You set it. These are all value decisions at the end of the day. So if you want to see a change, it's getting your voice heard with your representatives to say, you know what, that, that's not enough electricity for what they're doing to the river. I want to see a million chad back in this river, and I don't think 200 megawatts a year, you know, is, is worth that. And getting enough people to tell people that, because the cod fishing thing, everything, it's, 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 a value, it's a value choice. It ends up being a value choice. There are more, it's not just scientists saying this is the way it should be. And I think that there's a, become a misperception in American public life about that. But I may be wrong. Yep. <laughs> Technically, yes, striped bass are diadromous fish. They're anadromous fish. Technically, because we no longer have any spawning populations in Massachusetts, they get managed through our sport fish program. But yeah, uh, fantastic striped bass. It's an amazing, it's probably one of our most important resources, both recreational, really recreational fishing. It is the most important resource we have in the Commonwealth. And it also has a significant commercial fishery. <laughs> I didn't say I was sure. Ne never say never with fish. I don't trust anybody who says never with fish. <laughs> yeah, I, I think mo more than likely not. We don't, we don't, ha if we had undammed rivers, if our larger rivers were undammed, then yes, I am. I am so close to certain that we don't think about it being in Massachusetts because we all lived here, but I, I grew up on the Connecticut River and I did a lot of fishing on the Connecticut River. I did a lot of science on the Connecticut River 10, 15 years ago. I am so sure that there were spawning fish in the Connecticut River 10 years ago. I'm, I'm as certain as I could be, but um, I don't think al elsewhere in Massachusetts. Uh, no, because that uh, the first... Do I have enough? Sorry, I'm going to go way, way back to the beginning. Long way. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have enough map. All right, well, maybe this map will work. Okay, so here's the Merrimack River up here. This is the Hudson Harbor, the Baltic Dam. Merrimack is just over the tip. And there's the first dam on the Merrimack River. Uh, in Lawrence, it's the Essex Dam. And it's relatively low in the watershed. Sorry, glass in the bud. Like that, it's just too short of a length of river. Um, striped bass have buoyant eggs, um, so when they spawn, they float to the top. So they're going to be going downstream. They don't do well with high salinity. So the, most likely, the Merrimack. That's just not far enough up river for a, a striped bass to spawn. That the egg's going to float to the top, and in a day and a half, it's going to be in the salt, and it's probably going to die. If they could. You know, so historically, and they could swim into New Hampshire, yeah, spawning straight bass. We augment, yeah, absolutely, we augment the, um, well, we, I say we, we as in the general management community, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, grow, takes wild shad from the fish lift in Lawrence, 
uh, brings them to the hatchery in Nashua and spawns them out and then restocks the larvae typically into tributaries of the Merrimack where we're trying to restart population. Um, so we're starting to put them into Shawshin. Here's the Concord River somewhere in here, yeah. So this is the Concord River and there's a series three dams and lower in the watershed. That first red dot has been breached. The second has a good fish wheel, well, has a fishway on it that we're improving. The third red dot here right in the H in Shawshin, I'm working to have that dam pulled. Um, hopefully it happens, if not it's going to be here. And then that's a lot of, you can see after these three dots, there's quite a long area without any dams. Sorry. There's still Ballardville there, so they really like that's like two thirds done because those those were three dams right in succession, um, so that third dam needs to go. and building something that replicates what would be there uh, previously. So, I mean, while it looks like a stream, it's a highly engineered feature, you know? That there's full engineering plans, everything, all the stones were placed on purpose. There's weirs there. I mean, like, if you think about what they built there, it's a pool and weir fishway. They just built it with natural materials. Um, but it should replicate the ecological functions of a stream over time. They did plantings, unfortunately. They did plantings timed out with a drought and a gypsy moth outbreak. It's still gonna take 15 years for those trees to come back and properly shade the river like you're talking about, but they thought about it. Um, the basic facts that, you draw your own conclusions. That's a, I think it's a two and a half square mile watershed. Um, and it's the head pond, the spawning pond for river herring in there is, has a mean depth of roughly three and a half feet. So you can guess that it's gonna get very, it's called lily pond for a reason. You know, it's three and a half feet deep. It covers up with lilies all summer long and it's super warm. And it's like half an acre. The cost of that project was north of $500,000. So is that where you wanna put $500,000 for river herring restoration? That's what surprised the heck out of me, frankly. <laughs> me too. Um, we did just replace the, and there's still a bit, another fishway upstream of that into Lily Pond. It was a old wooden ladder that was failing, and so this winter we donated steep pass sections and installed those. So it's starting to sprinkle the new fishway into the actual the, that last little climb into the actual spawning habitat. So we're excited about that. So um, that's good too. What do uh, droughts and water withdrawal from the river affect uh, the numbers? Uh, not well. Like I said before, you know, a lot of these fish, you know, eel's not going to leave, so they can live in pretty poor water quality. But like river herring, you've got to get them in and out. And so when fish can't get in and out, bad things happen. <coughs> so those population figures that I showed in the last couple of years are starting to dive down. <coughs> I, I think that's going to continue because we've had several years of poor water conditions. Well, I, I, I'm not 
going to, yeah, so, we, you know, the returns from that stocking program were high, so it was discontinued. Um, and so I'm, yeah, so, I mean, stocking hood pond is an alternate approach. The first time we brought fish in from a, a southern, a Buzzards Bay watershed, which we probably shouldn't have done. I, there may have been some fish from the Charles, too. I wasn't here then. Yeah, but, yep, and so, um, but it didn't work. They stocked them in the main so it didn't work out well. So I'm hoping that by stocking them into more of a classical, I'll put alewife in, not blueback, and putting alewife into like a classical alewife spawning habitat. It's River Watershed Association has done a habitat assessment, which is, we have a protocol for that. It's a two-year process. They've done that, and they're working on the results now. Um, so I'm, we just got to make sure that they end up in down Howell Brook, and I'm hopeful that that will lead to more consistent and positive Selecting my project as a, at, at the moment, uh, the last time around I was up at the Parker River showing off that whole fish passage study both and the video counter. So we had the video counter going and people could see live video of the fish swimming through and we had, the, we would explain to everybody the, uh, the tracking system that we had to understand fish passage there. I am looking for partners, I want to do something different this year. I may be at the Little River, it's a possibility it could be at the Little River. Um, I may, well, the 21st is technically World Fish Migration Day. They're very open about it, and you'll see events filled under that. I saw one on, on May 2nd. Um, they'll be connected to that Concord River project I'm involved with. Um, that's that's going to be up in Bill Ricca. So uh, I will probably be on that Friday, the 20th, at the Upper Mystic Lake Stand in Medford. That's what I plan to do. That's been a great success story. Um, in 2012, there was a, fit, a brand new state-of-the-art Daniel Fishway. It's a technical fishway that when they rebuilt the dam, they, DCR put that in along with an eel way. And uh, the and they started a, the Mystic River Watershed Association started a volunteer count, and that's gone up from like 250,000 when they started it, up. and now we start to see the returns of the fish being able to get into Upper Mystic Lake and it's 600, 700,000 fish, and that's 17 miles up the river. So I, quite possible there's a million fish in the, coming back every year right now to the Mystic River, which is great. Um, we just worked with the town of Winchester to put a fish ladder at the next dam up so fish can get into a couple smaller ponds in Winchester, and then it will have, it's a water supply, so it gets a little funky and like flood control. So it's a different set of rules for the next big 200-acre pond, which is Horn Pond in Woburn, upstream of that. But we just worked with the town there. They had to rebuild that dam. And uh, they had a stone spillway that actually kind of functioned as its own little nature-like fishway with appropriate flows. So they gave us a bunch of rock and use of the big construction tools for a day. And I got to tell guys and equipment I had no idea how to run what to do. So that was fun. And, and like when I'm used to having like three seasonals and it's me, they did in 35 minutes when it takes me eight hours, so that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, um, Howlett Brook is an important tributary to the Ipswich, and what are the prospects, if any, of uh, improving fish passage there, particularly at the dam right by Ipswich Road? Yeah, I think that that's the first step, is um, communicating with the dam owners that there's going to be migratory fish, hopefully, there in the next five years, six years, and uh, under state law, dam owners have a, right, a statutory responsibility to pass to run fish for this. So I will work with the property owners to make sure that happens. There is a... a who plays the bad guy when... What? Who, who brings the bad news to the landowner? I try not to bring the bad news. I try and be a cooperative partner. <laughs> I've been told to start wrapping up. My phone is ringing, which is my wife saying, why aren't you home? <laughs> uh, so thank, thank you. you very much.
behalf of the Ipswich Conservation Commission, I want to thank Ben for coming this evening. Just so you know, um, he's part of a speaker series that's been going on since 2011. Um, if any of you are interested and you know a subject that you'd like to hear about, please get in touch with me or call the Conservation Commission office. Our next presentation is going to be May 23rd. It's going to be in this room at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And it's going to be identifying and eradicating the most common invasive plant species in this area. So if you have something on your property and you're not sure if it's an invasive species or not, Bring in a branch, and maybe we can get you some answers that night. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, Ben's going to be here for a couple minutes until he has to go home for his dinner, and I'll be here as well. But thank you very much for all coming out tonight. Thank you.